Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody watching on uh, live stream. Welcome. We're at the Celia Scott Weatherhead Center for Functional Medicine. It's our first Grand Rounds in our new center, so welcome. And we're privileged today to have an extraordinary physician and thinker and leader in functional medicine, Dr. Terry Walls, who was formerly at the VA, who was running the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic for MS patients uh, with great success and is involved in doing clinical research showing how diet and lifestyle can actually reverse or greatly improve multiple sclerosis, which is heretofore something we've never seen without medication. And she was actually an MS patient with progressive MS and was in a wheelchair for four years, could not sit up, could barely feed herself, could barely function, and discovered functional medicine and diet changes and was able to apply these to herself and now is walking, functioning, riding her bike and actually actively growing her career and building a new center called the Walls Institute which will further progress her research. She's the author of the Walls Protocol which is how I beat progressive MS with paleo principles and functional medicine. So I'm really pleased to welcome her and and her own story is quite extraordinary you'll hear it in a minute but she discovered that many of her symptoms and her ms was due to a trigger which was a lifelong load of toxins starting with uh, chemicals and paints like mercury cadmium and lead in her undergraduate degree in fine arts and in medical school with formaldehyde in many of her hobbies and growing up on a farm in iowa highly exposed to atrazine and other toxic pesticides, all of which accumulated to lead to her MS. So with that, I welcome Dr. Terry Walls. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let me get my uh, clicker here. Uh, and you see that I'm sitting, uh, it's not because of the MS, it's because I've had the uh, happy privilege of getting spinal stenosis along the journey as well. So standing for a long time gets to be a problem, so we'll just go ahead and do the sitting. Um, so here are the objectives. I'm going to uh, go past those. Other than say, I did take the time to write out some very nice objectives for you. Um, my disclosures, I have a grant funding direct to MS charity. I now also have funding from the National MS Society uh, uh, and I had in-kind funding from DJO, Pinnacle Life, TZ Press for our first study. Uh, copyrights to a couple of books, uh, trademarked uh, the Walls Diet Plans, the Walls Protocol, uh, and a couple of uh, companies that I've owned. Uh, and now also uh, the Walls Institute. So let me go back uh, to my story. Uh, in 2000, I became a patient. Uh, and at that time, I developed uh, weakness in my left leg. I uh, saw my uh, physician uh, who went through my chart and saw that 13 years earlier, I'd complained of dimness uh, in my left uh, eye when I was out rollerblading on a hot day, uh, getting ready for my uh, Birkebeiner, which is a 55 ski kilometer uh, race in northern Wisconsin. Uh, I had a big workup at that time, uh, including uh, MRIs of my brain and my spinal cord, and they saw lesions uh, at the high uh, cervical cord, C1, C2. And I got a spinal tap uh, and showed abnormal spinal fluid. And so a diagnosis of relapsing remitting MS was made. Uh, and they suggested that I get a second opinion, and as luck would have it, recommended the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and so I'll come back here. I uh, came uh, to the Cleveland Clinic uh, to get the uh, confirmatory diagnosis of relapsing remitting MS. Now, at that time, I knew that having MS is sort of a big deal. It's a progressive uh, illness. Uh, and when you think of the, the uh, downstream cost of having MS, it's a very big deal because the vast majority of folks will ultimately convert into uh, secondary progressive MS. And the cost is very high, both to society and the individual. Now, this is from a, a study done in Poland, uh, and it was uh, published in uh, 2013. The cost was $40,000 to $72,000 a year for drug costs alone. Uh, and that, on top of that, there's an annual MRI, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, 
office visits. Um, and as I said, within 10 years of diagnose, one half will convert to secondary progressive, uh, one half will be unable to work due to uh, severe fatigue, and one third are going to have problems with gait disability. And this has a big impact on the family because you're going to have lost income from the person who has the MS diagnosis. You'll have, um, and the MS is the leading cause of disability here in the US of, in terms of leaving the workforce early. Uh, it's a, a caregiving cost for, from strangers for the person that's become progressively more disabled. And there is the caregiving cost from the family members who have lost income as they have to provide uh, cares to that individual with MS. Uh, you're much more likely to have early and sustained nursing home care. And then there is uh, the MS-related pain, uh, which before the onset of gabapentin and Lyrica was very, very difficult to treat. In fact, MS was the leading cause or the leading diagnosis for all those people who were requesting assisted uh, suicide with Dr. Kevorkian. And I have a great deal of empathy for that because MS pain was a uh, big part of my MS diagnosis. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was referred to the Cleveland Clinic and I uh, got my care here uh, for the first three years uh, seeing uh, Dr. Stone over at the Mellon Center. And despite taking the newest drugs, uh, still uh, within three years of diagnosis, my disease had converted and I had uh, secondary progressive MS uh, and was started on uh, mitoxantrone. Uh, and I had a lot of weakness in my tors torso muscles. It was getting more and more difficult to set up. Uh, and I was having uh, more and more difficulty with fatigue. Uh, now, since 2003, I did the uh, North, uh, NARCOM's North American Research Committee on MS Quality of Life Survey. And I've just taken a couple of questions out of that, which was, uh, rate your MS symptoms. Were they uh, better, somewhat better? Uh, no different, somewhat worse, worse, or dramatically worse. So every six months, I'd say my MS symptoms were worse. And my fatigue, when I uh, first completed the survey, was mild. Um, but uh, I think this, my first year here is 2005. Uh, it's moderate, uh, it becomes severe, and it's total, which means uh, the fatigue was impacting every aspect of my life. So by the summer of 2007, so uh, June, I am so weak in the torso, I cannot sit up in a regular chair. So I couldn't sit, uh, I, I couldn't sit in the chairs that you're sitting here now. I had a zero gravity chair like this, uh, one at home, uh, one in my office, another uh, in the clinical area where I saw uh, patients with residents. Uh, and when I ate, I was in that zero gravity chair somewhat more upright, but I was still ha had to recline far back. And of course, my family's pretty nervous about how well I can protect my airway. I'm also at this time uh, losing my keys, losing my phone. I, uh, that summer, I'd lost my phone three times. I'd lost uh, my uh, smart keys uh, twice. And my uh, chief of staff uh, in July had called me in to say, uh, we're going to assign you to the traumatic brain injury clinic uh, come the middle of January. You'll be seeing patients with the physical medicine rehab doc and the psychiatrist, and um, you won't have residents. Now, I went home to uh, tell my uh, wife about this. Uh, she knew that, and I knew, that was a job I couldn't physically do. And so this was really the uh, VA and the university's way of saying, you know what, we've redesigned your job for you for quite a few years now, but it's time, we're, we're done, uh, and we're gonna force your hand to have to take uh, medical disability. I was depressed. It was not an, uh, a good time. Uh, and so I'm gonna give you a quick timeline of my illness. Um, uh, during medical school uh, in the 1980s, I began to have these electrical twinges of discomfort at first, uh, and I could tell that it's more likely to have this trouble when I, uh, was being yelled at by my attendings if I had been sleep deprived, uh, and the episodes of discomfort would last a couple of days, and then they would fade away. 
and they'd come on sort of randomly. Uh, and I could also tell over time the intensity and the frequency of these episodes. Uh, so they'd be a bit more frequent uh, and a bit more intense. Uh, in 1987, I had completed my residency. I was in uh, private practice up at the Marshall Clinic. And of course, you know, there, there's some stress with all of that. Uh, I am out rollerblading uh, after work because uh, uh, at that time in my life, I was doing uh, uh, marathons, uh, uh, long distance bike rides. I did uh, the Birka Bider, which is a 55 kilometer ski race uh, every winter. And so I was training on a lovely hot August day and I had a 10 miles uh, uh, a roller ski, five miles out, and I realized I couldn't see out of my left eye. Uh, so I took off my skis and I walked back. By the time I got back, I could see again. Had a big workup, and they really weren't sure what it was. They said, just don't ski in really hot weather. <laughs> okay, and if I did, I couldn't see out of my left eye. So I backed off in my training. And the episodes of my face pain continued to get a little bit worse, a little bit more difficult. Um, I finally did see a uh, back to neurologist, was treated uh, with gabapentin, probably not gabapentin, with Tegretol, developed a drug rash, had to stop that, and there was no drug therapy, I just sort of toughed it out. Um, eventually, I went back to see neurology, uh, went to pain clinic, um, and got pain injections, and then was started on gabapentin, which I used episodically. Uh, but these would become more frequent, more severe, uh, and then in 2000, I developed some weakness in my left leg. And that's when I uh, was diagnosed and started on Copaxone. Now, here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Stone mentioned the work of Ashton Embry and a group called Direct MS uh, Charity. And through them, I discovered Lauren Cordain and the Paleo Diet. So after 20 years of being a vegetarian, which really annoyed my uh, uh, parents who were farmers, um, I went back to eating meat but continued to decline. Now, I should tell you, I gave up all grain, all legumes, all dairy, so it was a big change. I stayed with uh, being a paleo, uh, paleo eater because I was like, I'm doing something. And I realized that, you know, it might take a long time to see any benefits. But I was continuing to decline, and the following year, I'd need the tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, 2003, uh, I get the wheelchair, I start Novantrone. 2004, I'm like, I gotta start reading the, the science. I'm uh, reading uh, and I begin uh, reading about uh, various vitamins and supplements. I decide that mitochondria are the big driver in what's causing uh, brain atrophy, what's causing progressive MS. And so I'm beginning to read and search what are the, the uh, vitamins, nutrients, and supplements I can use to support my mitochondria. So I'm adding creatine, carnitine, uh, coenzyme Q, B vitamins, and after a few I think it was about six months, I thought, I'm wasting my money. I'm wasting my money. I quit taking uh, the vitamins, and I can't get out of bed. And uh, you know, I, I, three days later, uh, Jackie comes in and says, you know, honey, I think you ought to take these again. I take them, and I can get up and go to work. And that was really exciting. And it makes me really curious. So a couple of weeks later, I try it again. I stop all my vitamins, and I'm exhausted. I cannot go to work the next day. So this is just wonderfully exciting news, very exhilarating. It really motivates me to continue to read the science and do this little self-experimentation. So I'm adding stuff, testing uh, ideas. Um, and what I have done is I've taken what had been a very fast decline and I've slowed it, I've made it more gradual. And I'm very grateful. But I, I am still declining. Um, so I, I've taken Tizabri uh, for several cycles. That gets pulled from the market. I get switched over to Celsept, another form of immune suppressants, which, by the way, uh, gives you oral ulcers, uh, leaves your skin sort of gray. You don't feel very good. But because I don't want to become demented and bedridden by my illness, I'm happy to take that Celsept. And the summer of 2007, I discover, because uh, I'm uh, on the Institutional Review Board reviewing paper, uh, reviewing studies, uh, a study by Dr. Rich Shields that is using electrical stimulation of muscles in the setting of new acute uh, traumatic injury to the spinal cord. And he's doing that to uh, maintain muscle strength in one leg 
uh, and letting the other leg become weak. And he's asking to uh, extend that study for another two years. And I think, hmm, could this help me out with MS? So I do a PubMed search. There's 212 articles. It doesn't take that long to read 212 abstracts. Most of them uh, are, are not relevant. There are a few papers uh, with uh, uh, stroke uh, injuries that occurred five years earlier uh, where people had been helped, and a few papers with uh, cerebral palsy. Nothing with uh, MS. So I then start searching for uh, eSTEM devices, and I'm ready to order my own. My wife says, no, no, no. You're going to call a physical therapist, and you'll see a physical therapist. And, uh, so I uh, see my physical therapist, who tells me that eSTEM is not approved for MS. Uh, we have some continued conversation. And he says, well, we, we could do this. Um, we could um, do the stem. You could maybe grow more muscles for your legs, but I don't know for sure that your brain could talk to those muscles. We could be making additional two to five pound weights on your legs that you can't use and making walking even more difficult. But with some more debate, um, he agrees to let me have uh, a test session. He also says it's probably going to hurt. You have a lot of issues with neuropathic pain. Um, but we, he agrees to let me try this. And he is right. It hurts. It hurts like hell. Um, but we do 20-minute session to my paraspinus on my back, on the left, on the right. Then we do my uh, quads. So I have now have done 24-minute workout. And by the way, at that point, I could only do about a 10-minute workout on the mat. If I did 12 minutes, I was too exhausted and, and could not work. So I just dramatically increased my workout time, tolerated it, and I felt great at the end of the workout, not during, at the end. Uh, and so Dave told me this was probably release of the endorphins. Uh, he agreed that I could have sessions. And so I came into clinic three times a week for the next two weeks uh, and trained. Tolerated it well. And he uh, then decided that I could uh, begin training at home. He arranged for me to get a home device. And I began doing e stim to my belly and my back. Well, I did my 10-minute workout. I'm going to back you up a little bit, because during the same time where I was discovering the eSTEM, I discovered this organization called the Institute for Functional Medicine. They had a course on neuroprotection, which I ordered and I took. Uh, and so it's a, uh, a lovely notebook of cases uh, and audio synch synced PowerPoints with uh, lectures that talked a lot about mitochondria. So I was really fired up. And I had a much longer list of vitamins and supplements that I now added. So I was, I was now up to 20 things. And so I was doing the eSTEM. I had this longer list of vitamins and supplements. And there was no dramatic difference. And I was doing all of this because I knew that, that uh, progressive MS does not recover, that I was doing all this in an attempt to try and slow my decline even further and to be able to walk the small amount of uh, walking that I could do for uh, a few more months. Uh, and then uh, in December, you know, in November and December, I'm like, you know, I should take this list of nutrients and get them for my food. Uh, and so I'm re redesigning my uh, food, but like, where do I get these 20 nutrients in the food supply? So I go to my dietitian friends. They don't really know. I go to the College of Medicine uh, Health Science Library. They can't really help me out. But the University of Google does. Uh, and so by the end of December, I've got this new uh, food groups that I should be stressing. I'm still following the paleo diet, but I redesigned my diet into what will ultimately become the WALS protocol. And we'll uh, get to that. And that is when the magic begins. So, um, and my uh, chair of medicine, who had seen this decline in this amazing recovery, um, said, this is so important. You need to write a case report up. And gives me an assignment of getting a case report. So this is my treating neurologist, uh, uh, treating physical therapist, uh, and uh, Dr. Shields, who was doing the e-STEM. Uh, so he wrote this up. And then he called me back, after, and we got that in. He said, now what I need to have you do is write a little research protocol. We're going to have you test this in other people with progressive MS. Uh, so this is a, a visual image of what it looks like uh, 12 months in 2007, 
can't sit up, I'm using a tilt recline wheelchair, 12 months of the uh, diet, uh, and I did the diet, exercise, e -stim, and I went back to doing a daily meditation. Uh, 12 months later, I'm able to do a 20 mile bike ride with my family. So of course, that really changes how I think about disease and health, and it would change how I practice medicine. Um, it, and so it really shifted my focus. Uh, and it actually now turns out to be marvelous that I'm at the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic because I'm really focused on teaching these folks that, yes, there's a whole lot that you can do if we focus on diet and lifestyle to restore the function of your brain. Uh, and we talk uh, to our patients a lot about mitochondria, uh, talk about brain, talk about neurorestoration, talk about neuroregeneration. And uh, this comes down to uh, thinking, if we look at diet, diet's going to impact, uh, I think, through, through two main uh, avenues of approach. One is its impact on human cells, that is us, and the other is the impact on our microbiota, that is the bacterial uh, and uh, yeast and um, parasites, uh, single cellular organisms that live within us. So I'm, again, I'm just going to give you some, uh, just a few um, references. I could go on for uh, weeks about all of this. But this is just some of the known literature on casein, the protein in dairy, and gluten, uh, one of the proteins in grain, in MS and schizophrenia. So liquid cow milk, but not cheese, is associated with uh, higher rates of MS across, I think, 27 countries and 29 different populations. And antibodies to casein and gluten uh, were more prevalent in recent onset and uh, long-term diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, and there's also another paper which I, uh, which I, I did not include in here that makes the same observation uh, casein and uh, gluten increase the risk of Parkinson's. <clears throat> now, uh, let's get in. So the foods I excluded, uh, casein uh, and uh, so dairy products and gluten uh, grain products. Now, mind you, I'd been paleo for quite a while that that was not enough. So excluding that had not been enough to recover me. I, it was not until I reorganized my diet. So what did I add in? I paid a lot more attention to what I needed to add to make sure I was maximizing nutrition for my brain and my mitochondria. First group I'm, I'm zeroing in on are sulfur-rich foods in a very specific way, the cabbage family, onion family, and mushroom family. And here's why. So mushrooms, mushrooms increase nerve growth factors uh, and these are in some uh, lab studies. Um, lion's mane mushrooms. Uh, they also uh, activate natural killer cells. And they will prime innate and adaptive immunity. So it does great thing for immune cell function and does great thing for nerve cell uh, uh, factor and uh, BDNF. Brassica, which is the cabbage family, and uh, onions. Uh, improve your detoxification enzymes, increase intracellular glutathione production, will increase gamma butyric acid uh, production, your neural inhibitors uh, for the brain. So it's increasing your neural protection. It improves endothelial function, particularly the onion, uh, garlic family. Uh, so again, excellent stuff for our brain. And this will improve our ability to process and eliminate all of those toxins that Mark told you uh, that I'd had likely stored in my fat and contributing to my decline. Leafy greens. Why, why uh, was I so keen on leafy greens? So uh, greens are a great source of vitamin K1, which <clears throat> in your gut, your bacteria, <clears throat> will metabolize to K2 MK7, and you'll reabsorb that in your ileum. Now, K2 is really important in the production of myelin, and uh, K2 is also important in the uh, efflux of calcium from your um, endothelial walls and your heart valves, uh, where if you have a lot of vitamin D, 
you'll deposit calcium into the endothelium in the um, uh, heart valves. If you have a lot of K2, you'll take it out of the endothelium, out of the um, heart valves, and into your teeth and your bones. And you'll make more myelin. <clears throat> Plus, if you have a lot of greens, you're going to have a lot of carotenoids and magnesium. <clears throat> Colored foods. And particularly, uh, blue, black are really good for you, but you want all of the colors. And uh, pigments are a great uh, marker for uh, the polyphenols, the antioxidants that are great for resuscitating, uh, again, your mitochondria and quenching those free, ad free radicals. But in addition, <coughs> blue, purple, black are associated with improved outcomes for, uh, uh, in terms of uh, cognitive decline in neuroprotection. Uh, here's a couple of papers that looked at blueberry powder uh, versus placebo in people who had early dementia or mild uh, to moderate cognitive decline, and there was improved performance in the placebo group versus the control group. And the amount? One cup of fresh blueberries or frozen blueberries. So pretty easy to achieve uh, from a dietary standpoint. So my, the target, um, it, and I'll say I had probably uh, considerably more than this. Um, so it's three cups of greens, three cups of deeply pigmented, three cups of the sulfur-rich uh, category. So uh, I'm a tall lady, about six foot tall. Uh, in my VA clinic, uh, uh, mostly men, uh, it's pretty easy for them to get to nine cups. And uh, realistically, I was probably having 12 to 15 cups of vegetables uh, every day. Lots and lots of vegetables, which I did not do when I was a paleo eater. It was, it was more meat, some vegetables. Um, <clears throat> I was also much more appreciative of organ meat. Now, uh, when I grew up on the farm, we had liver and onions every Friday, and by God, you ate it, or you got a second serving. Uh, and my, my parents, you know, we were pretty tough farmers, and you followed the rules. Now, pre-industrially, organ meat was what you ate because you didn't waste any of the animal, and a third of the animal, when it's uh, slaughtered, uh, would be classified as organ meat. Uh, it's an excellent source. Uh, the organ meat is a great source of uh, ubiquinone or coenzyme Q, <clears throat> minerals, uh, essential fatty, essential, uh, uh, fatty acids, uh, fat-soluble vitamins, and water-soluble vitamins. K2, uh, uh, the bacteria, when you eat greens, will make it into K2MK7, and you will store it in your liver as K2MK4. So liver is a good source of vitamin uh, K2. It's also a good source of pre-made uh, vitamin A or retinol. The vitamin A in greens and vegetables and orange vegetables is beta carotene, which you will have to convert uh, into retinol. And if you have a chronic disease, it's more likely that your enzymes at converting it are less effective. Uh, so this is just a little chart that lets you know that <clears throat> organ meat is a superfood. Uh, I'm sort of illustrating that 100 grams of kale versus turkey versus liver versus heart is a superior source of uh, minerals. And here a superior source of uh, the fat-soluble and the water-soluble vitamins. So um, grass-fed meat, organ meat, wild fish. Uh, and at this point, I was like, if it wasn't organic, I wasn't going to eat it. <clears throat> and if it wasn't organic personal care product, I wasn't going to use it. And I really had liver now uh, twice a week. Um, intermittent fasting, uh, calorie restriction, dietary restriction. Uh, the longer, uh, the more time we spend without consuming calories, the better for our mitochondria. Uh, and so. Uh, I would intermittently go at least uh, 16 hours and occasionally 24 hours um, and occasionally three days uh, without eating food uh, intentionally to lengthen that time uh, for my mitochondria without food increases the number and increases the efficiency of the mitochondria. Uh, I think, uh, it also, by the way, increases nerve growth factors. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the other thing that food does. It feeds my microbiota. Um, so there's emerging evidence that the microbiome is, uh, has a role in MS. 
Uh, this is a study from Japan that looked at 20 patients with MS and I think 40 controls. And they saw that there was a depletion of Clostridia species that uh, is involved in the uh, regulatory Th17 cells. So if you have um, MS, is part of this due to altered microbiota? Small study, suggestive, but certainly supports my theory that the microbiome is a major player in MS. This is a, uh, another paper, again, that looked at uh, the microbiota in people with MS, people who don't have MS, and they looked at the uh, disease severity. And they're able to predict who has MS, who does not have MS, and were they having a uh, flare of their symptoms. So this is just a look at how well we are feeding our uh, microbiome. The average American westernized diet, 15 grams uh, of fiber a day. The uh, US government target is 30 grams a day. Uh, if you follow the Wallace diet, we've uh, analyzed this, uh, and we see that you, uh, using recipes and a week's worth uh, of menus and in our study, it can get up to 80 grams. If you uh, analyze hunter-gatherer societies, they're eating 100 to 150 grams a day. How much should you feed your uh, microbiota? A lot more than you are now. Uh, I think it's a pretty uh, fair answer. So we're, we're very fond of uh, fermented foods. Uh, so we, we teach people how to make um, kombucha. We teach them how to make fermented cabbage, uh, uh, kimchi, fermented pickles fermented beets, fermented carrots. Uh, we talk a lot about poop. You want to poop, you want to poop every day. If you're not pooping uh, a snake every day, you need more fiber. And we, so we talk about chia pudding, flaxseed puddings, uh, resistant starch, uh, plantain flour, uh, green banana flour. If you're pooping uh, diarrhea, uh, soft pudding stools, you need to back off and you may need to eliminate the raw foods and have only cooked foods until that resolves. So in our clinical trial, uh, these are the interventions that we used. And I'll tell you, it uh, was actually quite an ordeal to get approved. Um, we had to go, uh, it, was, it was a challenge. The, now, the, part of the reason we were able to get approved is that I was a member of the Institutional Review Board. The IRB had seen my decline uh, and then my recovery. Uh, and so they were very interested in approving the study, uh, but gave us the restriction that you need to do what you did uh, and mimic that as closely as you can. Uh, and so this is what I did, the modified paleo diet, um, targeted vitamins and supplements. Uh, I would, had gone back to a mantra-based meditation, so we uh, taught our subjects how to do that. And we taught them how to do uh, a simple self-massage. We gave them a home exercise program that targeted the uh, muscles of walking, and we uh, taught them how to do e-stem. The study diet, nine cups of vegetables was the target, and if you were petite, we understood that you, uh, you couldn't get your nine cups in, so we didn't want people to overeat or overconsume. And we excluded gluten, dairy, we also excluded eggs, because that's the third most common, and because I had to exclude eggs, because uh, of my own food sensitivity, we had to mimic what I did. To make the uh, diet more tolerable, we let people have two gluten-free starches per week. So that's two small pieces of gluten-free bread per week, or a half cup of rice, twice in a week. So mostly vegetables and meat. We talked about the importance of stopping sugar, processed foods, uh, gluten, dairy, and eggs. Uh, and the targeted vitamins were uh, methyl B12, methylfolate, vitamin D, with the target of getting the vitamin D between 50 and 100 nanograms uh, in fish oil. We taught them a mantra-based meditation. We taught them how to do self-massage. We taught them a stretching exercise program. Uh, for the gastrocs, the quads, the hamstrings, uh, and the back, the erector spinies. Uh, and, we, and we gave them uh, an exercise program targeting the, those same muscle groups. In order to be in the study, they had to tolerate e -stem. 
not everyone did because uh, the e-stem hurts. And for some people, it's too activating for the neuropathic pain, and they just couldn't do it. Uh, and so they couldn't be in the study. The other thing they had to do, do to be in the study, they had to do a two-week run-in where we gave them food logs, and they had to follow the diet 100% for seven days straight. And if they couldn't do that, they could not be in the study. And so uh, we, uh, we had a 25% of our folks could not make it through that two-week uh, run-in period. We did become much uh, more uh, clear in what our expectations were. Uh, and so we got so that we, we, we had much greater success at people being able to enroll and make it through that run-in study. The other thing that we had to do was we had to show that um, for safety, we had, to ha enroll t we had money to do 20. We were able to enroll 10 and show that people could implement, it was safe, uh, and so we got the uh, 10 folks in, and then uh, showed that safety data, then we were able to enroll the next 10. So we have 20 data that we're gonna show here. Uh, people were between um, Kane and Walker, and the average age was uh, 51. And their fatigue score uh, was quite severe at 5.5. The score goes from one, no fatigue, seven, total fatigue in every aspect of your life. Our biggest side effect was if you were overweight, you lost weight without being hungry. A few people had skin burns, so we had to uh, re-instruct them on how to properly do the uh, e-stim. Uh, we radically changed what they ate. Like most Americans, they ate a lot of grain and few vegetables. My public health folks say if they can get someone to increase their intake of vegetables by one serving a day at the end of 12 months, that's a home run. We had this dramatic change from 1.5 to I think uh, almost eight servings a day. And that is a stunning level of success with a uh, change in diet. This is the change in quality of life, the uh, green uh, and blue bars, improved quality of life, improved energy levels. The uh, red bars is the decline in fatigue severity scale score, uh, 2.38, and the uh, p-value 0 0.0005. Now, mind you, when you have only 20, no one expects you to have statistical significance. So uh, again, very gratifying uh, that we did so well here. Uh, the, the, the factors associated with greater success, if you had less disability, shorter disease duration, and you're able to do more of the stuff that we asked. It's no surprise. If the family did the diet with you, you were much more successful. If you did the diet and everyone else ate the same old way, it was a big struggle. And the more exercise you could do, the better the impact on the gait. Or maybe you were getting better so you could do more exercise. It's hard to know. Um, we have a study that we're doing now, thank you, um, dietary approaches to MS fatigue. Uh, we're recruiting. Uh, you have to be within 500 miles of Iowa. Uh, the MS diet study at uiowahealthcare.uiowa.edu. Um, uh, I did this for the VA for uh, three years. Uh, we saw people with a wide variety of diseases. Um, we did this with group classes. Uh, we uh, had the teaching kitchens. I taught people in the group how to do a timeline, a matrix. Uh, and then we had the dietitians in a group teach them uh, how to cook and make this food. Uh, same kind of diet. Uh, we had very basic primary care labs that we, that we monitored and very, very basic lab, uh, uh, supplement interventions that we use. And we had remarkable uh, improvements in biometric outcomes and remarkable improvements across many disease states. Uh, this is the best part. We're gonna show you some of the changes uh, from our study. Um, and uh, this is secondary progressive MS. Uh, it takes her 120, go ahead and start the video please. It takes her 127 seconds uh, to get up, walk eight feet, turn around, and come down. We're so concerned about her ability to walk, we chase her with a chair. If you watch her feet, you see that she has difficulty picking her toes up, and her toes are going to get stuck on the floor as she walks. Go ahead and start the other video. This 
So did you start the other video? Yeah. So what you see is uh, 12 months later, she can uh, arise from the chair much more easily. She can uh, walk. She can uh, swing her leg forward. She can pick up her toes, uh, dorsiflex much more effectively. She's now able to uh, do little walks in the neighborhood. She's far more independent. She's able to climb stairs now for the first time, uh, she thinks, in about six years, which means she can visit friends and extended family and can get out of the house. Uh, next. And her fatigue, by the way, has gone from, what, 5.6 down to 4.4. So big impact on fatigue. Uh, oh, I move it, sorry. OK, so this lady has primary progressive MS. Go ahead and start the slide here. Um, and fatigue is her biggest issue. So her fatigue score is 6.7. She uses uh, two and uh, the two walking sticks. And go ahead and start the next slide. And in um, three months, she's able to walk without the canes. Her fatigue is markedly reduced. Again, primary progressive MS, there's no uh, known treatments, no FDA-approved treatments. People just go downhill either very, very rapidly or uh, somewhat more slowly. Um, and I guess I go next. Uh, and you can start this one. Uh, this lady was working uh, part-time. Uh, fatigue is a major issue for her. She uses a cane for short distances and a walker for long distances. Uh, her son uh, is living with her. She's decided that she cannot live independently, so when he finishes her, uh, his graduate degree, she's going to go move into assisted living. But start now. After three months, she can do this. Now, that gait looks normal to me. My physical therapy friends tell me that they can tell it's still not quite normal. Her fatigue has dropped from 5.3 to 1.4. Really quite, quite, quite remarkable. Oh, timed up and go. So it's, uh, you sit in the chair, you stand up, walk eight feet, turn around, come back, and sit down in the chair. So it's timed from the time you up, go, and come back. And then here she is, uh, and she can now jump. And then she can also do this, this other activity. And I really like that, so we're going to watch it twice. <laughs> so at the uh, end of uh, three years, this was a lady who, when she enrolled with us, struggled to drive 15 minutes. Uh, her uh, granddaughter had been born and lives four hours away. So she's able to now drive to go see her granddaughter four hours away without any problem. And her son has moved six hours away, and she can drive to uh, see her son without any problem. Uh, she never really got into jogging, so she doesn't jog. She does do Pilates, does do weight training, and certainly feels like she's gotten her life back. So uh, the key thing I want, I want all of you to take from this uh, message today is this, in the interventions that we use work across multiple disease states. The modifiable lifestyle factors, that was my toolkit. I had very basic primary care testing in my uh, VA clinic. We had very, very basic... Uh, uh, supplement interventions. My toolkit was diet and lifestyle with the expectation if you're going to work with me, you have to commit to doing the diet and lifestyle recommendations 100% for 100 days. Um, and we had favorable impact across many disease states on fatigue, mood, uh, and cognition. The best steps, get rid of the sugar, get rid of the processed foods, and eat vegetables, lots of them. Lots, lots of them. And I think this is my last slide. Um, and so we'll stop here and take questions. Thank you, Dr. Walls. And uh, we we'll appreciate that. Um, I'm going to just start with the first question, because I think it's something you missed yes. in your story that's critical, which is how you deliver the program in oh. a way that is inexpensive, scalable, and effective. Yeah, so um, what I'm going to talk about is what we did when I was back at the VA. So we have a group classes. Um, so the first class is uh, an introductory class where I tell my story, uh, describe the tenets of functional medicine, uh, and uh, the intervention. So gluten-free, dairy-free living, nine cups of vegetables. Uh, and that 
that's step number one. Then we'll talk about meditation, exercise in addition. And give people the option to say like, oh, that's too hard, I'll just stay with primary care. Or I am ready to do this 100%, and they'll come work with me in the group classes. Or I want to uh, ease into this, so we call that the glow, go slow. Uh, they'll go work with a dietitian uh, individually. The go is come to the group class. If they come to the group class, uh, their next visit is a four-hour visit, two hours with me, where we do a timeline and a matrix. And I teach it to a group, uh, usually about eight folks. And, they're do and I teach them how to do their timeline, how to do their matrix, and uh, review their um, modifiable lifestyle factors, uh, what to do with their diet, stress reduction, exercise, social networks. Um, and then I identify for them what are their highest leverage points and what were likely the environmental factors that led to their organ system uh, dysfunction. Then I hand that group off to our dietitians who run a uh, cooking class and we give them uh, cooked greens, uh, we give them a green smoothie and help them reimagine their relationship to food. Then, so that takes four hours. Then they come in every six to eight weeks uh, for uh, what I think of as like a uh, AA model, uh, sort of a, uh, a two hour session that is run with me and the dietitian. We have a 15 to 20 minute educational component, often talking about uh, labs. Then we count up how many people we have in the room, which might be eight to 15, uh, and we divide up the time and so everybody gets to check in, say like, hi, I'm Terry Walls, progressive MS. My original MSQ was 150, today it's 22. I follow gluten-free, dairy-free 100%. My big struggle is when my grandkids come, I get them treats and ate the whole bag before they get there and then I'm terrible. Uh, so help me figure out what to do when my grandkids come. And then everybody gives them some feedback. And then they go on to the next person. And we go around the whole group and then I try to have like a five to 10 minute closing at the end. Um, what really seems to help is that peer-to-peer -peer coaching about how you deal with family that doesn't want to buy in or uh, grandkids, whatever the challenge is. Those, and you can come see us for a year. Then you graduate and then you're done. The other thing you can see us forever is the skills class. In the skills class, people come in. We, again, we have a 15-minute uh, Q&A session. And then we teach skills. And uh, the skills might range from uh, what I call the resilience factors, what is your uh, life mission, what is your purpose, the meaning of your illness, to uh, movement, tai chi, yoga, strength training, to cooking, more cooking classes. Um, and uh, to my surprise, the most popular class was the resilience fact is the resilience factor classes, having to do with uh, life's purpose and life's meaning. Terry, I, I think that what's extraordinary here is that there is no one-on-one -on -one visits with a physician. There's an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one visits with a dietitian, but this is done in a group model over time with profound results that totally transforms both the content and the delivery of healthcare, which I think is very instructive for us as a way to deal with the burden of chronic disease. So I think you pioneered not only the content of how to treat disease, but also the delivery model. You know, it, it would also tell everyone uh, <coughs> that I, I did this when the VA was very resistant to functional medicine. Functional medicine was not a word I could use, so we called it therapeutic lifestyle clinic. I did it with no functional medicine testing. We only did things that we could just order through primary care clinics, so homocysteine, B12, folate, vitamin D levels, lipids, A1Cs. And I had to agree, uh, the only uh, uh, things that I could use were uh, B12, plain B12, not the methyl, version, plain, plain B12, uh, a B complex, and fish oil. I could let people go by on their own if they wanted methylfolate, methyl B12, N-acetylcysteine, and algae. So very ba basic stuff. Tremendous, tremendous. And it's, it's really a testament to the power of food as medicine. So any other questions? There's an online question here, Terry, that asks if you are, have worked with any other kinds of e-stim, such as cold uh, laser or frequency-specific microcurrent. So I've worked with cold laser myself. 
Um, I have, uh, I'm aware of uh, frequency specific. Uh, I have not worked with it uh, myself. I've also um, worked individually with uh, Beamer, uh, pulsed electromagnetic fields myself, and I, and I found that to be helpful. Um, but did not use that in our clinical trials. Any other questions? You touched on this a little bit. Okay. You touched on it a little bit um, when you said, you know, the grandkids were coming over and you ate all the trees before they got there. How long do people take to recover after they've kind of fallen off the wagon, as it were? Okay. Um, so let me uh, touch uh, uh, a little bit. So we've had people have dramatic results, uh, lupus, RA, scleroderma, uh, myasthenia. Uh, and then humans being what we are, after six months, feel like, you know, I, I could indulge. Uh, and a few people get by with occasional indulgence and don't get into trouble. But you also find some people who have an occasional indulgence, get a dramatic flare of their disease, and then it may take many weeks to get the disease quiet, and they may have to take uh, pulse cytomedrol or some other disease-modifying therapy. Uh, so I do a much uh, more explicit uh, uh, recommendation that if you get response and you stop the program, you're stopping disease-modifying treatment, and you should expect a disease flare. And, you know, and, and myself, uh, I want to make it very clear that um, if I uh, accidentally get exposed to gluten, in um, 24 to 72 hours, I'll get a flare of my face pain that is horrific, uh, that will be so horrific I cannot, um, you know, you'll see me jolting, I won't be able to uh, talk, I may not be able to walk, I'll need high dose prednisone, and I may need high dose solumedrol to stop it. So I now carry prednisone with me, so if I get my first twinge of pain, I'll begin my prednisone uh, 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 taper uh, orally so I can hopefully not need that solumedrol. It's an incredible statement that food is a disease-modifying drug. Absolutely. It's a very powerful disease-modifying drug. And if you stop, expect your disease to flare. Dr. Walls, um, the, um, the, the, the connection with the microbiome seems incredibly interesting and just very recently coming up. Um, and also, um, for other uh, types of diets that have been... I'd say somewhat successful or have provided a lot of comfort to people with this, like the one by Dr. Jelinek, I believe. Yes, um, yes. I, I just wonder if uh, for, for, for patients that are all over you know, the internet learning about both these approaches, if you um, have some connections with him that you would you might know, both explore how micro, the bi microbiome is modified through so these different approaches. This is a great uh, question. Uh, so I, I do have the uh, opportunity that we've had donors from all over, all over the globe uh, donate to the Walls Research Lab. And so in the study, we're comparing the Walls diet and the Swank diet, we're freezing uh, microbiome, we're freezing blood, for so we'll be able to do an analysis of the changes in the microbiome. Uh, and we'll see what happens if you follow what looks like the gelatinic diet. Uh, or you follow the Walls diet, or you're just doing uh, usual care. Uh, so we'll have that. We'll also have, uh, we're freezing DNA and RNA, so we'll be able to change, uh, monitor gene expression as well. Um, so yes, these are great questions, and we will be able to answer them. One last quick question. Yeah. So just to clarify, your um, gluten intolerance or sensitivity, I, maybe I missed it, um, you are not a true celiac by definition. I don't have diarrhea, no. no so no, the, no the classic uh, mistake in our, amongst our colleagues is often it's only GI related. So I just wanted to kind of emphasize the fact that you have extreme outward symptoms by exposing yourself to gluten, correct? I have extreme neurologic symptoms. You know, so I have uh, horrific pain. And in addition, I uh, will get uh, other neurologic symptoms. So my most recent uh, exposure that resulted in the face pain also had weakness of my right hand that took weeks to recover. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, when I was working with the MS Society to uh, do uh, this, uh, the trial that we're doing, the Swank versus the Wall side, there was a, a, a request to have a crossover. Uh, and we discussed whether or not, and many people thought I should do a crossover design. And, you know, that there'd be 
a lot of reason to do that. They'd be very nice. But there's this problem. Ethically, I can't possibly do that because if one of my hypotheses is that there's going to be a subset of folks who have uh, severe symptoms if they eat gluten, and then I cross them over, you know, I'm going to intentionally create harm. And I just said, nope, I can't do that design. So, Terry, there's some other questions online as well. Uh, we've got about uh, 250 people who've been watching yes, this live thank stream you so right much here. For watching. Um, through IFM, and uh, it'll be rebroadcast over the next 24 hours. But they asked about, well, um, what do you do with vegan patients or vegetarian oh, sure. patients? So, um, and, and my paleo friends gave me uh, a really hard time for uh, being so sympathetic to vegans and vegetarians. But, you know, I, I was one for quite a while, so I am quite sympathetic. Uh, for them, um, we do have, uh, by first level diet, I have people use gluten-free grains uh, and, of course, gluten-free legumes. Soak them for at least six hours. The, that uh, uh, sprouting process uh, uh, modifies the lectins. And I did not talk. Lectins is another uh, big problem. Lectins are the compounds that plants use to poison animals so we don't eat, eat the plants. Uh, and they mostly target insects. But for people who are genetically susceptible, uh, eating the seeds uh, can make you ill. Uh, therefore, those of us who have a chronic disease were somewhat more likely to have sensitivity to those lectins. That's one of the reasons to avoid uh, seeds and legumes. If you do eat seeds and legumes, soaking them for at least six hours uh, greatly reduces the inflammatory impact of those lectins. You, you mean grain? You don't mean pumpkin seeds? or No, I mean seeds. So. In, in people who are sensitive, uh, even pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, nuts and seeds may be a problem. I don't take nuts and seeds away from uh, most people uh, in our diet. Uh, in uh, the, my clinical trial, we do for 12 weeks. In the clinical trial, uh, we'll have them either avoid the nuts and seeds or soak them uh, for six hours. And then we reintroduce after uh, 12 weeks. Any other questions? I mean, I, I have a question. You didn't mention fat. You implied Well, it, I love but, fat. But, you know, since yeah. your know, nerves are made of fat yeah. and your you brain know, is made of fat, so how do you address fat? We want people to eat lots of fat. Uh, and I talk about the ratio omega-6, omega-3, uh, ideally about 3 to 4 uh, omega-6 to every omega-3. 60% uh, of our cell membrane is either saturated fat or cholesterol. So I don't view cholesterol as uh, a problem. I don't view saturated fat as a problem. I think uh, oils, uh, olive oil, uh, and any liquid oil that is liquid at room temperature should be eaten cold uh, and not heated, because when you heat it, you uh, uh, damage some of the antioxidant components, and you increase the possibility of oxidizing that fat. So we do want people to eat fat. Uh, I, there's just so much information. I. I did leave the fat out. But yes, we stress fat in the diet. Which is the big difference from the Jelmic diet. It's very big. So, so uh, it, in their diet for fidelity, we stress at least uh, four servings of grain every day uh, and less than 15 grams of saturated fat. In my diet, we stress all the vegetables and at least 20 grams of saturated fat every day. So we want to be sure that there's plenty of spread between the two diets. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Walls. This has been really an extraordinary conversation and uh, you, know, you really done pioneering work I think the thing that I want to just emphasize is that most people think in, that functional medicine is about testing about supplements and you've been able to do this in a poor population with little resources without extensive testing or extensive supplementation using the power of food as medicine and they don't have to eat organic food and, you know, and I say, don't worry about it not being organic. Uh, don't worry about whether it's grass-fed or not. You do have to cook at home. You do have to eat vegetables. Powerful. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Wells, and your work. Thank you.